Hello, Kai. Hi, Dr. T. I am your father. No, I'm, I know I'm not your father. I'm just joking. Calvin, how are you? Oh, hey, Dr. T. <laughs> <laughs> Save me. <laughs> oh, Kai is... He's replaced his background. Background, yeah. But there's no Kai. There's just background. It's because my camera's covered. Oh, there's Kai! How you doing, buddy? Oh, hi, Kai. I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's actually the same background I've been using. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> so, um, uh, how are things going, Kai? Talk to me. Tell me something. Um, I, all right. It's normal school things. I have a presentation tomorrow. Really? For what class? Uh, advanced chemistry, 270. Oh my God. Who's teaching that? Uh, Ryan Muir. Muir. Oh my God. Oh no. An Arachta scholar from Stanford. Trying to make his mark in the educational world. It's it's more of a bio class than a chemistry class right now. Poor bastards. Great. Poor bastards. Do you hate it or do you like it? Um, I like it. It's just I need to learn like I'm learning a lot of new bio terms, I guess, that I haven't heard since mm. like Gen Bio or yeah. yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Got it, got it. Well, my condolences. Thank you, thank you. 
so um so how would you compare our classes like in terms of the amount that you're learning it okay the amount that you're learning while in class as opposed to outside of class it's about the same well for your your class it's like a lot of things that we're learn we learned in 155 or yeah it's pretty much a lot of things we learned in 155 but we're building upon it in a way uh-huh compared to his where it's just a lot of new things that i, I haven't learned or mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. so it, so okay and i bet a lot of folks feel exactly the same way you do and so I'm left to conclude that you guys are foot dragging so that we, we don't learn very much in this class. <laughs> so that we go slow. Is that true? Is that true? I don't think we're doing it on purpose because not everybody had uh, 155 with you. Oh, my God. Oh, like maybe Calvin's doing it on the show. Oh yeah, Calvin's doing it, but not you, right? Even though Calvin volunteers, and you never volunteer an answer. <laughs> oh my God, oh my God. <clears throat> hey, Pauline, how are you? Hi, Dr. T, I'm good, how are you? I'm good, I'm good. Can you see me? Yes, I can, you're in space. I know, I'm, I'm floating in space you're out of this world <laughs> oh god and uh you you know not what you say <laughs> okay adam how are you sir hey dr Tarr, i'm good lily how are you i'm good how are you good kenya how are you oh you are in a fiery flamey place i'm just here dr tarot you mean oh my now? god oh my god oh my god hey Kun, how are you hey good excellent and let's see we got leslie how are you doing good thanks all right ivy very exhausted very okay. exhausted. Ah, why, why, why are you exhausted, Ivy? Or I'm Leslie, sorry. Sorry, Leslie. Wait, did I get confused? Ah, these yes. windows are going around. <laughs> sorry, Ivy. Why are you exhausted? I have not been getting very good sleep lately. Ah, God, I hate that. Do you, do you like stay up all night and play on YouTube and stuff like that? That would be, that's what I do. Yeah, a little bit. Um, I try to sleep earlier, but my body's just like, no, you're not allowed to. I know, I know, I know, I know. And you really can't fight it, can you? Yeah, so, I'm like, around, yeah. around 1 a.m., I'll start feeling like really tired and I'm trying to sleep, but my body's like, no. Yeah. 4, 4 p.m. is bedtime. 4 a.m. is bedtime, not 1 a.m. And I'm like, no. right, right. Yeah. I know, I know. My son's the same way. <clears throat> So one thing that helped me a little bit was to do, um, it's called a dopamine uh, detox, where you, um, uh, you have to give yourself like 24 hours where you have no excitement, like boring ass day, a very unpleasantly boring day. And, and, yeah, and, and you, you, you'll you find that your mind is like, oh, man, you can't eat good food, you can't watch good TV, you can't do anything, no no social media, no politics, nothing. And and if you just kind of got it in your brain that that's the way it's going to go, like, oh, uh, I guess I'll do some homework. And he's like, uh, uh, do your homework. And then eventually you did your goddamn homework. My God. You're like, oh, I want to go to bed now. 
It's a little impossible here because I live in a household of six with two dogs. It's kind of inherently oh, exciting. I got it. I got it. I got it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, dogs, they actually, they behave like the, the owners. Have you ever noticed that? My dog does not get up unless I get up. Ah, there you go. There you go. Yeah. So, so when your dog notices you being very boring, it will get slightly less hyper, I, I predict. Okay. Dan, are we good? Excellent. Aditya? Richard? Good. I got head nods from everybody. So, um, ba -da -ba -da -ba -ba. so I was thinking about ta ta uh, talking today about uh, quantum dots a little bit, uh, and then uh, Raman. I've just sort of been literally meandering all over the fucking place. I'm sorry about that. I just cannot. I'm like Ivy. I just can't do anything about it. I could work 24/7 on this, and it would none of what I do to work on it comes out in the in the product what you guys see. So we're just gonna have to deal with it here. But um, uh, so uh, <clears throat> I guess that's kind of like just me saying, sorry if I suck, but um, uh, quantum dots then are um, semiconductor nanocrystals. They're basically just like tiny bits of semiconductor. And um, uh, you can grow quantum dots in solution of a whole bunch of varieties. And so, for example, these are the examples here are cadmium selenide, and they just have a beautiful spectrum of colors. So I'll pick on them a little bit. <laughs> and um, uh, so cadmium selenide, let's see here if I can find my periodic table. Uh, cadmium ba -da -ba -da -ba -ba. and selenium is, this is a, um, it's like, this is like a group two metal, right? Uh, and then because it's like one, two, and then there's, these have similar qualities to the twos, and it's three, four, five, six, seven, eight, right? So this cadmium is like zinc. It's like a two plus metal. Zinc and cadmium, they both have two plus ions. So does mercury, by the way. But <clears throat> cadmium, and then you go over one, two, you get to four. That's the column that has silicon, right? You go one, two, and there's selenium. So this is a uh, <clears throat> two, six. It's group two and group six, cadmium and selenium. Does that make sense? So um, silicon is a group four semiconductor. You know, diamond is a group four semiconductor. Germanium is a group four. Tin is basically a weird metal and lead's a metal, right? But um, uh, if you have silicon, you can dope silicon with uh, boron and, and phosphorus, aluminum sometimes, you know? Uh, but uh, you can also make, so, so group four makes beautiful semiconductors, right? You can, as germanium is also a semiconductor, you can also make three, five semiconductors. You can make a semiconductor with a group three, mix in equal amounts with a group five. Gallium arsenide, aluminum phosphide, boron nitride, <coughs> indium antimonide, uh, indium arsenide, you know, gallium aluminum arsenide, indium gallium arsenide, you know, there's there's whole bunches of these fours and three fives that you can make. 
and they all have different band gaps. So this is by combining uh, gallium, aluminum, boron, indium with um, nitrogen, phosphoric, phosphorus, arsenic, and antimony in different ratios and amounts, you get sometimes, you don't always, sometimes you get semiconductors with different band gaps. Right? So um, <clears throat> uh, how many of you remember the telephone where you put your finger in it and you went, and then you let your finger out and it goes, D -d 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 -d. and then you put your finger in the next one, and then it goes, D -d 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 -d. okay, I remember that shit. I remember that shit. Oh I remember that. That's my, and we had a one phone in the house. And if it was long distance, we hightailed it to the phone because that was expensive. <laughs> okay, so, and you may remember that even back in them old days, you could get red light emitting diodes. You could get red. And the red LEDs were, I'm ashamed to say I'm not sure, but I believe they were silicon. Now, <clears throat> green took a while longer. And blue took a while longer still. And now you can get lasers in all these different beautiful colors, right? Red, green, blue. And you can get ultraviolet lasers. You know, they, you know they, it's just about 400 nanometers, not anything hard. You know, um, but these are these are the products of band gap engineering where get a bunch of engineers playing chemistry, you know, and they, <clears throat> they take these elements and they put them into quartz vessels. They evacuate them, they seal them, and they cook them. By the way, Carla, I didn't say good morning to you or good evening to you. How are you doing? Good. Ah, ah. I'm sorry. I completely missed you, but, um, but, um, you remember anything about silicon from Chem 155? Oh, I can't hear you. I can't hear you for some reason. Oh, there um, we go. What's there we go. 155? I don't. I don't think I had to take that class. Oh yes, you did. I'm sure you did. I don't think I took that one. Really? What is that class? It's instrumental analysis. It was at 7.30 in the morning. Dr. T, I don't think the biochem kids had to. Yeah. Oh my God. I'm sorry, Carla. <laughs> I have you confused with somebody else. Okay. Oh, oh my God, I'm sorry. But, um, okay. How about you, Colleen? Do you remember anything about silicon from Chem 155? Kenya? I remember oh. you calling a peppermint patty. That's about it. <laughs> oh my God. Oh my God. Okay. So we had this conversation with Calvin. Um, Dr. Terrell, could yes. you use silicon in like the columns? Aha. That's, that is a common misconception. Silicon, there's three things we should know about it. Uh, silicon, Silica and silicone. Okay, let me let me switch to the um, to the uh, camera. Let's see here. Um, so um, let's see. Gosh, this is like so small. Let me see. Let me make this larger. So. Um, the thing of which I speak right now is silicon. It's just pure silicon. It's just, uh, it's just uh, the pure substance. And it's a crystal and it's sort of a black crystal and solid, right? And then there's um, silica, which has the molecular formula SiO2. This is silicon, 
This is silica. And silica is, um, it's, it's, it's like ultra pure glass. Let me focus this thing. There we go. Uh, it, it's, it's not really glass when it's just silica, uh, but, um, but it's uh, because it's a very, very high melting material. Um, call it a very uh, high melting glass. Right. And silica is what the cuvettes are made out of. Right. And then there's silicone, right, which is uh, uh, which is a trade name for poly dimethyl siloxane which is SiOSI O like that. And silicone is is uh, rubber. You know, this is um silicone is this uh you know it, it, it can be tr translucent. Uh, it's rubbery. It's great high temperature material. And you can make PDMS uh, by taking the, uh, the ethyl acetate. I, I, I think it's, um, uh, it could be an acetate or an anhydride or something, uh, but it evolves. It's it's like um, it comes in these tubes, you know, that and you put them, and it's like caulking, right? So um, uh, those are the three uh, types of uh, silicon that we normally talk about. But the only type that 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 is a semiconductor is is silicon. All right. So now, um, better, better be. Oh yeah, we were talking about um, the periodic table, and we we're talking about Chem one fifty five. Because in Chem 155, we talked about uh, the evolution of uh, band structures in, um, in materials. So um, uh, let's hear, let me, I'll give you a couple more examples here. So I'll write these down. So we've got, um, we've got um, group four, got carbon, silicon, and germanium. We've got three, five. And, um, uh, you know, you've got boron, uh, aluminum, gallium, and indium. And then uh, nitrogen, pho phosphorus, arsenic, and antimony. And then you've got two, which include um, uh, basically zinc and cadmium and mercury and uh, uh, fa and uh, six, which are um, oxygen, sulfur, selenium and tellurium. And these guys here, let me um, go back here. So these are the, these are the elements that make semiconductors. It's either this, these guys, 
or these guys, or these guys. Okay. So you'll notice that all the semiconductors are either group four, um, three fives, or two sixes. And I'm sure there's many that I've missed, and there's probably some, some exceptions to this rule, but the great majority are here, right? And um, it's, uh, it's easiest to describe the uh, genesis of uh, band structure uh, by talking about um, silicon. Because uh, silicon is a tetravalent um, uh, material. Right? So when silicon bonds, you know, it forms this beautiful, um, it's actually a diamond, a diamond like structure, right? But we can flatten it out into two dimensions here just for fun, right? Right, and so um, so by uh, condensing into this lattice, then every silicon um, can satisfy an octet, right? So it can have that uh, magic number of electrons, and it can also um, uh, and it it forms a very strong crystal. It's high melting. Um, material. Um, and um, what happens as you bring the silicon atoms together, right? Let's think about that. Let's think about bonding from silicon to silicon, right? We've got Si and Si, right? And they, they each have their four valence electrons here, right? And as they come together, <clears throat> they form a chemical bond right? and <clears throat> what happens is that the energy level of the orbital, there's an atomic orbital in which this radical electron exists and an atomic orbital upon in which this radical electron lives, then there's a molecular orbital than where this orbital exists, right? So atomic plus atomic makes molecular, right? <clears throat> and um, the idea here is that the energy level of this orbital splits into a bonding form An anti-bonding form. So here's um, this is like a sigma, and a sigma star type orbital, right? So this is um, uh, this is silicon A, silicon B. This is the isolated um, uh, orbital, whatever designation it could be. And then when they come together and they overlap, they form a bonding and an anti-bonding state. And so these two electrons here, they form a bond there. And that is why uh, these two silicon atoms are happier together than they are apart, right? If you have two gas phase silicon atoms, they will bond and that bond will be stable. So this is nothing earth chattering here. We're just kind of going over it, right? Now, the next thing that we want to describe is what happens when 
<clears throat> instead of just a single pair of atoms, you've got a whole periodic array of atoms. You know, all these atoms in uh, in a in a huge lattice. Right? And I'm not the person that knows that in detail, but I know enough to be dangerous, and that's what I want to make you guys. So um, uh, now. In, uh, in becoming dangerous here, what we're going to do is we're going to say, well, if we have instead of SI plus SI, if we have SI infinity plus SI infinity, then what we have here is that as these come together, there's um, a whole there's an, literally an infinite number of molecular orbitals. So there's, there's four infinity plus four infinity. So there's eight infinity orbitals here, right? I'm just waiting for someone to sort of call me out or laugh or something because you can't really multiply infinity by eight or anything, it's just a concept, right? But, but the thing that happens here is that all of the bonding states, they end up very closely spaced. Right? And all of the anti-bonding states end up very closely spaced, right? right? And, um, and because silicon, you know, it, because it forms this perfect crystal, um, ex excepting for the surface atoms, which are a little different, there's, uh, the bonding is all satisfied in, in a silicon crystal, right? So you can say, well, there's, you know, for any two, there's a pair of electrons there, 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 there. And you can just use the alpha principle. And you can just fill, fill up this, this gi ginormous molecular orbital. That makes sense so far to everybody? No objections? Because if you object now, I'm gonna kick you out of the class. Literally, I'm just gonna kick you right out. You're, you're never gonna set foot on San Jose State campus again because I have a little, little doggy and he's gonna go, wah, 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 wah. he's gonna catch you. I chase you away. Stepped, I've never stepped foot on San Jose State's campus in the first place. You haven't. Aha! Yeah. You're you're a you're a you're a Corona you're a Corona student. I am. Oh my goodness! My goodness. Well, <clears throat> I'm sorry you've had to endure me as your as your uh, as your introduction to San Jose State. But um, tell me if you learn anything. I'm so, having a great time. Good. Excellent. That's what I like to hear. Ah. I feel so much better now. Oh my God. Okay. So this is an, a molecular orbital and this is a bonding orbital. And this is an anti-bonding orbital. Right? <clears throat> So um, let's take, oops, let's take another slight step back here. And let's talk about what happens uh, in bonding and anti-bonding orbitals, right? Um, 
So if you have, let's say you have a, um, uh, let's say you have F2. Well, I'm gonna actually write this on a different piece of paper because it's a little bit of a throwaway topic, but I just wanna throw it out there anyway. Okay. Let's say we, well, I don't know. You know, this, this is like a Feynman lectures. These are the Roger lectures. Every word must be preserved. So let's see here. Um, let's take an aside here. Let's look at F2. This is F. F. Right? And the the um, quickly assembled and non-rigorous uh, bonding scheme is the, 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 the chlorine, chlorine. You've got a sigma, a sigma star. You've got a bunch of non-bonders, right? And the ground state looks like that, right? Bond order. Not sure if you're familiar with that, but that is equal to uh, one uh, because it's like um, you take the um, number of electrons in the bonding MO minus number of electrons in the anti-bonding MO, and you divide that by two. That's the, oops, that's the bond order, right? I think the stupid thing is going to weird it out here. Let me just scoot this over here. There we go. So now let's now let's photo excite this puppy dog. Well, we've got F. F and now we've got this is now the excited molecule, right? And the bond order here is equal to what? I'm sorry, my artistry is so horribly, horribly bad. I'm is literally. It still one? Yeah. Is it still one? Okay. So let's let's uh, the number of electrons in bonding mo. I'm confused. Okay. Equals one minus the number of electrons in the anti-bonding is equal to one, that is equal to zero. Zero divided by two is equal to zero. Oh. So the bond order here equals zero. Yes? So quite literally, if you photo excite um, into, into this state, you know, there could be some non-bonding levels in here, right? There could be other alternatives for that electron, right? but if you, Put it into the sigma star, sigma to sigma star, that molecule will fall apart. Right? That will dissociate. I mean it's it's not gonna necessarily like fly apart. Well, it could. But basically what you have is this is energy. This is R, R minus R zero here. And the, um, the uh, let's say this is, oops, sorry, you can't see any of that, can you? Hey, Robert, how's it going, bud? That's my son. So um, 
he turns 21 tomorrow. So um, I asked him what he wants. And um, yeah, and unfortunately I've completely ruined him up to this point. He already knows how to mix drinks. He's basically an alcoholic. <laughs> I was going to say he could have a gin tonic with you. That's right, but he already does that anyway. So I was just all a ruse. He just made me one the other night and was like, hey, I don't have to taste yours this time. So, Dr. T, he can legally have a gin and tonic with you. That's right, that's right, that's right, that's right, that's right. This, this meeting will be recorded and I will be kicked out of the parent of the month club permanently. But um, so um, uh, we have to create something for him, something fun for him, right? Okay, so this is, this is, this is a potential energy curve that could work for uh, fluorine, right? Where there's a, there's a, a vibrational potential well now this is this is uh, potential energy, right? And potential energy um, for this guy is at a minimum at a certain bond length, right? And that's because when these two atoms come together to the right length, they share that electron, and that that covalency stabilizes these two atoms together, right? Now. If you photo excite this molecule, what happens is that this well goes away, right? So then you have a, a dissociative curve like that. So this is the, the uh, potential energy versus radius curve for F2 star, right? So if you, if you photo excite this guy, what will happen is there'll be a so-called vertical transition because you simply take this state, right? And you excite it into a new manifold here. And this new manifold is basically corresponds to the formation of two free atoms, right? These two atoms will begin to dissociate, right? So this, there's nothing really so deep about this, but I wanted to talk a little bit about um, you know, the meaning of a bonding in an anti-bonding orbital, right? And what a bond order was, because I feel like that's something that can kind of go a little bit wanting in, in our edge imitations. So, um, does everybody have a full grasp of what this, uh, diagram here means. No? Wait. No, Richard? Okay, excellent. Excellent. So um, so first of all, this is this is the vibrational wave function that I put here. Right? And there's there's another one up here that's um, that and then there's a there's another one there, but but these are, this is V equals zero, one, and two for the ground electronic state. And what I've done is I've sort of rewritten this state diagram in terms of R minus R zero, right? Because um, as the atoms, um, I have to look at my little tiny thumbnail picture. As the atoms push together, their potential energy increases. And then they can go back to their equilibrium positions. And if you stretch them apart, their energy will go up too. That's the meaning of this potential well down here, right? And then if you stretch them too far, the thing will dissociate into two atoms, right? If you just keep stretching, It'll fight you a little bit, but then it'll kind of let go and they'll be free, right? 
So that's why the, the derivative dE by dr uh, goes to zero at um, as r goes to as r so sorry as r minus r zero uh, be, goes to a uh, say positive infinity right goes to some larger value right so the bond breaks. Oops, the bond she has broken. Has anybody here watched SpongeBob SquarePants? I love SpongeBob. Oh, he is brilliant. And then there's um, Squidward, who's always playing the trombone. And he's super annoying. But he's all arrogant, you know? And SpongeBob is all like, dee -dee 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 -dee. I know nothing. <laughs> okay, so, um, so, um, why, uh, why is there a parabolic minimum in this curve? Tell me about that one. Richard. Uh, that's the, the ground state. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is this is the ground electronic state, right? Right. And <clears throat> What is this minimum point here? What what is this point? What is this r minus r zero? What's the significance of that minimum point there? That's just the average bond length between F two. Yes, exactly right. Exactly right. And so as you push the atoms together, what happens to their potential energy? Ah, so which direction is pushing them together, left or right? I think it's left. Yeah, this is together. And this is apart. Yeah. So why does the energy go up but then level off as we pull the atoms apart? Bond breaks, they're not really, I don't know, talking to each other anymore. They're not. Mm -hmm. Exactly right. Exactly okay. right. Okay. So this technically, this is this is actually called the soft wall. And this is called the hard wall. So Dan, can you describe to me what happens as the R minus R zero value gets towards, um, uh, becomes negative? The R minus R zero value becomes negative. Uh, I'm not sure that I could guess it gets, I'm not sure by what you mean by negative. Ah, so when, when, at this point here, the R equals R zero. R, R, R is the variable that's varying here, right? And R zero is a constant. R zero oh, is the, R zero is sort of like the equilibrium bond, like you could call it that, right? So it's then as R zero gets greater than R, that means the bond is breaking because it's larger than the bond length? Right, as R becomes greater than R zero. So as R becomes less than R zero, then this, this function becomes negative and the potential energy also goes up, right? And why does the potential energy go up there? 
Because you're forcing the two atoms together. <laughs> exactly right. And why does the energy start to shoot up really quickly? Uh, the Coulomb Coulombic repulsion. Exactly right. Exactly right. Yeah. So <clears throat> technically, it is actually poly repulsion because yeah, um, you are um, Coulombically. It's still it's still all neutral, right? And as you push the atoms together, you know, I'm probably wrong about this. It's probably a beautiful mixture of pure columbic and pure poly type repulsion, right? Because the, 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 the poly principle says that you can't have um, any two quantum particles with all the same quantum numbers, right? So, um, so you can, so you can have two particles in an orbital if their spins are opposite, right? Two electrons, right? And now as you, as you take the, take this molecule and you start crunching it together, you're starting to, um, try to overlap these orbitals and that's a big no-no in energetically because it's being in a violate the Pauli principle. It's also probably expose, exposing the columbic repulsion of the nuclei to one another too, you know? because there's, to, to try to confine electron density in, in a smaller and smaller space between the nuclei is also extremely costly energetic. That has been known since like the 20th century, right? Because, uh, uh, the guy who discovered the electron, I think his name was Thompson, J.J. Thompson or something like that. He started thinking, ah, well, you know, what's, you know, what is a neutron? You know, they, well, actually, I don't know if they knew what neutrons were at that point in time. But by the time the neutron came into, into the picture, which was like 1915 or so-ish, they were thinking, ah, a neutron could be a proton with an electron inside it, right? But somehow they knew that trying to confine an electron that much, there's a humongous energy cost to that, right? And so as you, it's a similar question, right? As you, as you bring these nuclei close together, you start to pay that price. You can't just pack the electron density in there between them, right? And that's a good thing because um, I don't know if you've ever seen what happens when protons touch, but it's not pretty. Huh. Okay. What happens when when protons touch? Okay. So um, basically. Um, <laughs> I don't know, you can get fusion sometimes, <laughs> but it's, it's sort of like a nonsense thing. It's my friend Fred used to say that. Because in, in our normal experience, um, every force that we experience, there's gravity and there's electrostatics, basically that's it. You know, electrodynamics, but, but you know, all of, the, all of the solidity of materials and chemistry, that's all electrostatic forces that's holding you in your chair, that's, you know, keeping your glass together, everything that's all electrostatics, you know. But the nuclear forces are ginormous. They're just huge. They're like, like a million times greater than the electrostatic forces. So that's why nuclear energy is so huge compared to chemical energy. Okay. So um, after that, long digression into the dissociative nature of fluor difluorine, right? Um, we can continue our conversation about silicon here. Oops. Uh, having a, having a, a bonding and an anti-bonding orbital.
and uh, the 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 bonding orbital in in a in a bulk silicon crystal. This guy is called a Uh, it's normally completely filled. And uh, the antibonding orbital will be normally completely empty with some funny, bu funky business happening at the surface where there are unsatisfied valences. But I, I don't really even know what, what happens there. So, um, so now these are, this antibonding orbital is called the when 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 there's so many uh, orbitals packed into s such little space in terms of energy, right? This could be, you know, um, this whole span here might be um, uh, maybe uh, two uh, electron volts, right? Um, I gonna say that there's high density of these. Ah, then then what we what we refer to these um, these collections of orbitals as bands, and this is called the conduction band. And this is called the valence band. And um, I think we should, I think we should ha start a rock group and call ourselves the conduction band, right? Or we could start a classical group and call ourselves the valence band, maybe. That would be cool. Why not the other way around? Well, I think the conduction band is like, it's higher energy, you know? Of course, I'm, I don't even play an instrument, you know, so what the hell do I know? But, you know, it probably it could be that there's so much pressure on people in classical orchestras that they're, they're going to explode. But in any case, the conduction band is normally empty and the valence band is full. And the conduction and valence, they're sort of archaic terms, a little bit misleading, right? <clears throat> conduction band is called conduction band because um, the material conductivity uh, is extremely low and it's lowest at low temperature, right? Right, this this these curves will look something like this. And then the thing will melt or evaporate or decompose. So, you know, mainly what's talked about is just this region here where there's a, <clears throat> there's some proportionality between the uh, conductivity and the temperature. This is actually opposite of metals. Metals have a, this is, this is characteristic of semiconductors. Metals on the other hand are more like Metals, they, as they get cooler, they conduct better because in a metal, there's always uh, many conduction electrons. And so when they experience a field, they flow very easily, but sometimes they bounce off of um, uh, phonons, like when there's, when there's uh, lattice motions. Uh, an electron can be cruising along and then change its momentum. 
and then that will slow them down basically. So, so at, at cold temperatures, metals that conduct better, and at high temperatures, semiconductors conduct better. Right. <clears throat> and so, um, uh, Now, in um, uh, uh, so and then so this is basically uh, we won't even talk about doping right now. Maybe we can get to it next time. But um, uh, this is this is how semiconductors form, and the reason that um, semiconductor will conduct more at higher temperature is because there's a possibility of thermal excitation of carriers into this empty band here. And when this, when this electron is in an empty band, then there's nothing to keep it from drifting in the direction of a, an electric field. So, um, uh, so an electron um, in the conduction band uh, contributes to the conductivity. And the hole that it leaves behind is in the valence band. Uh, does too. And um, electrons can be promoted. Thermally. or optically uh, in some cases. How are we doing, Kai? I like that you're focused. I like, I see your face, you're looking thinking about stuff. Is this all boring old crap that you're happy that I'm going over because you know it from Chem 155? Or is this useful as a review? Or is this sort of like a good second time trying to learn it? Uh, useful as a review and it's helpful going over a second time because I didn't really get it. Since it was like Excellent. 8 a.m. in the morning when I first learned it. I know, I know. It's better at 7 p.m. than 7 a.m., huh? Yeah. Ah, my God. That's so brutal, and it's coming again. It's coming again in the goddamn spring. <sighs> Are you teaching 155 next semester? Oh, you know, it's like, why? Why does it have to be 7.30? In the goddamn morning, if Are nobody's you even in person lab, I, I'm gonna try. I'm gonna try to have in person labs because um, I'm just, I just gotta get out of this fucking house, man. I'm gonna die here. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I just got. I need to go back. I need to be pried loose, you know, because I'm losing my now my what's. The few marbles that I have left are quickly running down the drain. You're going to need somebody else to buy you coffee, huh? That's I know. Cool. I know. I know. I know. Uh, note to self. Try to get a new time slot for the spring. For Kim 155. It's, it's hard. I've tried it in the past. But I'm going to do it. I'm going to try to do it. Okay. So. So electrons can be promoted thermally or optically, right? And, and um, 
So, um, uh, so if they're optically promoted, that's called photoconduction. So you can actually pulse light into semiconductors and see a little transients in their conductivity, in their photoconductivity. That tells you how long lived the electron hole pairs are. Does that make sense? Yes. No. Yes. So when you when you when you when an electron is is promoted. Um, the electron hole pair, um, uh, they can be swept apart. That's very hard to read that swept, isn't it? be swept apart and that and that's what con conductivity is that's kind of what conductivity is is when when charges move in the influence of a field that's conductivity so um uh, so um basically um we're describing you know uh, semiconductor here and, you know, kind of coarse detail, but, but now when we talked about um, uh, let's see. the, um, the, uh, the fours, we did a four, right? We did a four example of silicon. And you can use the same analogy for carbon and germanium, germanium right? Then you can mix and match like, um, Aluminum arsenide, indium aluminum arsenide, I think that's what the blue LEDs are made of. It's just sort of a strange combination of these things, right? And they're, the band gaps are larger or smaller depending on the elements involved. So, um, uh, and you know, you can, if you count up all the electrons, for a gazillion silicon atoms and a half gazillion aluminum and a half gazillion phosphorus is the same number of electrons, right? They can have the same bonding patterns. Just the magnitudes of the, uh, the band positions are a little bit different. And the crystal structure matters a lot, you know? Um, silicon uh, is, its crystal structure means that the optical properties of the band gap are not that great. But gallium arsenide is has has a, a great a great high high mobility carriers and um, optically stimulable carriers and things like that. So so there's some good things there. And then the particular um, quantum dot that we saw it was made from cadmium uh, and selenium, right? Cadmium selenide. And the reason that they come in different colors is simply because the band gap changes as a function of the size of the uh, uh, nanocrystals, right? So for example, um, and you can do this with silicon too, right? When they're, uh, You've got bulk and you've got, um, let's say 100 nanometer. And then actually let me get, not get too unhinged here. Uh, and these guys, ah, so these, these guys go down to say um, 10 nanometers down to one nanometer, right? And then um, probably, for the bulk, th these are going to be near IR, right? Greater than 1,000 nanometer um, uh, 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 band gap. And 
And then when we get down to 10, then we've got but a- Joe can't see the- Oh, sorry. Oops. Sorry. <laughs> Should probably try to show these both at the same time because they're so purdy to look at. Got the greater than a thousand nanometers band gap for the ball. Then you get down to 10 nanometers and you got about 560, maybe 540. This is 540 nanometers is lambda max, the emission, right? And this gets all the way down to about 400, right? About four, ah, so it's called 460. So, um, uh, so this is a red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, you know, that type of thing. And uh, when we think about the size scale here, um, basically what's happening is that the, um, uh, the band gap is a function of the size of the molecule, right? So if you've got um, 10 nanometers, there might be um, 10 to the six atoms. And one nanometer, there might be uh, 10 to the two atoms. Okay. Maybe, you know, maybe a few hundred, right? And then as we go make these large changes in order of magnitude of the number of atoms in there, the, the band gap, this uh, is maybe, basically as we make, as we make the extent of this crystal smaller, we confine the electrons in a smaller three-dimensional space. It's becoming more like a molecule, basically, right? And that means that the, the band gap here becomes larger. Dr. Terrell, could you move it up a little bit, please? Yes, sir. Thank you. Oops, uh, okay, so that's right. This is maybe, uh, this gets down to 460, right? And um, so it's the, um, the three-dimensional confinement of the electrons in the nanocrystal oops nanocrystal uh, make uh, make it uh, more molecular and um, uh, make the band gap larger. And so you'll see a beautiful, beautiful example of that. I'm gonna let uh, Kai and Richard take some notes here. Although I will publish these notes from today. Although they aren't gonna make much sense unless you've 
kind of sat through my tedious explanations. <laughs> good. All right, so uh, a good example of that is these guys, right? So now uh, the, these, uh, all of these uh, uh, quantum dots here, make some notes these are made um, made using solution chemistry probably not non you know uh, no water or o2 and you know stuff like that um, maybe not uh, I don't know. I don't actually know. But the thing is that they're made, um, they're made using, uh, oh darn it. I'm OCD. I have to do it. I hate myself. I hate myself right now. Okay. Um, but you can just change the conditions in, in which you make them. And then um, you can uh, change the size, the size outcomes. You know, it, it's probably it's probably a time thing in this case. So um, uh, you you mix the reagents, and in time, the uh, nanocrystals grow. Probably Ostwald ripening. Mechanism, something like that. And by just simply quenching the reaction at a different time, Um, and you get large, uh, you get different particle sizes. Okay, so um, uh, I know that Abe worked on this for a while, and he was getting beautiful results and stuff. I think he was making them. Um, I think he made could have made some cadmium solenoids, some other similar quantum dots. And, you know, it's not trivial, but it, you can describe it in one sentence. So it, it takes a graduate student no more than a year to actually accomplish. So, um, uh, So basically, you can make a, a different chromophore, a, seri a whole series of different chro chromophores are distinguishable, right? With the same, the same excitation wavelength. Um, uh, using a single recipe. You know, now, cadmium selenide is not the ideal biolabel, right? <laughs> because cadmium is fucking toxic. And selenium is even fucking toxicer. If you know what I mean. Like, cadmium will kill you. And it'll give you itai itai, which is Japanese for ouch, ouch. And you die in agony. I shit you not. I shit you not. It was discovered in, in Japan when they were mining. And they 
the 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 the, the people were just like ow oh, ow oh, it hurts and it's like in Japanese that's itai itai and so they called the disease itai itai and that's cadmium poisoning right selenium on, a, on the other hand, goes straight to your genitals and kills the next generation through deformities. Yes, selenium is a teratogen, meaning it, it, it deforms your babies. So you might want to stay away from it. Just for make a mental note there. When someone invites you to do some selenium chemistry, and then points to the lab from a distance and says, yeah, just go in there and do it. You might want to say, uh, I think I'm going to find somebody else. But, um, but it's lovely, right? Because you can make all these different chromophores, right? And uh, you can bioconjugate them. Like you can do the same thing with zinc, zinc oxide, right? And you can get away from some of these toxic metals, right? And we, we can talk more about this, but um, but you can make different colored chromophores and you can bioconjugate them differently, right? Or you could like you, you could, you know, um, you basically surface passivate them differently. You know, you can use all kinds of interesting chemistry there, right? And uh and you can get them to stick to different parts of cells and you can get them to stick to certain targets and whatever. And then you can see them, you can see an individual particle in a microscope real easily in a decent fluorescence microscope, right? In, in one sense, because they have enormous stoke shifts, right? You can use uh, ultraviolet light, like 250 nanometers or 350 or something like that. And you can excite a 600 nanometer uh, luminescence, right? So it's got a huge change in the wavelength, which makes it easy for you to filter out the excitation wavelength, right? You can look at the luminescence of these that have much, much different wavelength than you will excite them. And so you can label things very effectively. So if you're a biochemist, for some reason, they like to do these kinds of things. So we, we, we humor them all the time. But um, so did you learn anything today? Yes. Good. Kenya saved your bacon right there. She did. Because if I had not heard in three more milliseconds, if I had not heard that you learned something, then I would have to change my teaching approach dramatically. And then I would have had to go on a drinking binge too. But in any case, I will post all this stuff for you guys. And I will see you Thursday. Okie doke. Oh, and, and I'm, I'm halfway done with the grading. So if you haven't gotten your grades back, don't worry, they're coming. On the, on the stupid homework. Bye, everybody. Thanks, Dr. T. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Dr. Carol. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Have fun tomorrow. Bye. Thank All right, thanks. I will. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye.